Well, hey, Liverpool One Church. Hey, guys. It's so great that you've joined us today for online service. Hey, I'm super excited. Are you? So excited. Come on, it's going to be a great service. And hey, if you're new, we just want to say welcome to Liverpool One Church. Yes. It's great that you're here. And hey, let us know who you are in the chat. We would love to welcome you properly online. It's a great season to be part of Liverpool One Church, right? It is indeed. And even if it's your first time, hey, what better way than yeah. your own home, the comfort of your own home. And we hope that you love today's service. It's going to be great. I cannot wait. It's going but to be how amazing. good was last week's service? Last week we had Pastor Aaron Cole wow. join us from, from, the USA. from the USA. Come on, Aaron Cole, what a word. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for blessing our church. Yeah. We love you. We appreciate you. But hey, if you did watch last week's service, if you did it, you can still catch up on that. Why don't you even share the link with someone yes. you know? That'll be amazing. We get to share the love, share that word. It was awesome. Definitely. Right? And I'm going to be sharing today's service ahead before it's even started because I know it's going to be amazing. So Go ahead and share this link with someone. Invite them to come and join us for online church today. And I am really excited. Luke's going to bring an amazing word in just a second. But hey, we're going to kick off with some worship. But hey, welcome to Liverpool One Church. Enjoy the service. Church, Sunday is still the best day of the week. And we would love it if you sing with us today. Break it through all the lies with the truth and the sound of the wind. Let the roar of heaven begin. Can't stay silent, can't stay still when you show up in power, glory revealed. Oh, can't stay silent, can't stay still when I feel.
Church, it is so great that you are joining with us online. And hey, wow, like you guys, band, you guys are smoking hot today. I've not heard that song before, the heaven is invading thing, but I absolutely love it. Really appreciate all of you guys just making this happen for us in this season. And let me just start out just from the off by saying, hey, we're so glad that you're with us today. However you've come to find us, maybe somebody's sent you a link and invited you to be a part of our online church experience or maybe you've been coming for years now, like you're so welcome and we are super glad that you are here, especially for week one of our brand new series, Normal is Overrated. Hey, a couple of weeks ago, I did something and honestly, it kind of freaked me out and it was something that I haven't really paid a lot of attention to before, but apparently in an iPhone, you can hit general and go through your settings and you can look at your screen time. Like you can actually find out how much time you spend devoting your life to this little magical friend right here. And honestly, seriously, I was like horrified. I saw my screen time and I was like, there's no way that that can be true. Like that surely must be somebody else's device, right? And at first I tried to pass it off and say, well, it's because of Spotify, you know? I use it to play some background music. So that's the real reason for my incredibly high screen time. And then you can individually look through every single app that you have and it shows you how much time you spend on the news channel, how much time you spend on Sky Sports, how much time you spend on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, the lot. And seriously, it freaked me out. I was like, that could not be accurate. So I hereby challenge you, Liverpool One Church, to go on right now, I give you full permission, so long as you're not watching church on your mobile device. Like hit settings, hit general, and then click on screen time. And just take a look at how much time you devote to this magical little friend over here called the iPhone or the Samsung. Sorry, Samsung if you've got one of those or a Google phone or whatever it is. Because the truth is, every single one of us have got these devices now. What's crazy is I, I can actually remember the day where if you wanted to take a photograph, you'd have to carry a camera around with you. If you wanted a torch, you'd need a physical torch. If you wanted a sat-nav, you'd need a tom-tom or a Garmin in your car. But now think about absolutely everything has changed because of the development of the iPhone. And I am no Luddite. I love the fact that these little creatures have become, well, so dependable. I mean, we use them for everything. Chances are you use them not only to stay connected with your friends near and far, I bet you've even, some of you have booked flights and holidays on your iPhone. Some of you, you know this thing. This thing is the hand that feeds you because of the almighty Just Eat app, right? I mean, there are so many things you do, online shopping, online banking. I mean, absolutely everything that we used to have to do compartmentally is now so accessible as a result of this iPhone. On one hand, it's the biggest blessing. And on the other hand, it can be the biggest curse. And the reason why it can be the biggest curse is if you're anything like me, what this thing actually now brings to the forefront of your attention because of the way life is, because of the way we interact with one another, because of the way social media has changed so much for us, now not only is it incredibly practical and it enables you to like live your life more simplistically, it now gives you great insight into what everybody else in the world is doing. Now that, that's not necessarily a problem. But what can be a problem is when that highlights to you what you're not doing in life. You know, when you see like somebody else is out scuba diving in the med again and you're there looking at the Mersey and you're like, is this ever going to change for me? The reality of it is, is now more than ever, you're able to find out exactly where you are not and who you are not as we compare most of what we do and who we are against everybody else. And it's so easy to do because of this little device. And the truth is, I'm not gonna do a message or a talk here at church today about like social media being a bad thing or the use of iPhones being a bad thing because in my heart, I don't actually believe that it is. I mean, there is so much good stuff that can come out of these iPhones. They are so normal to every single one of us now. Like our entire lives often depend on them. I mean, you can stay up to date, you can find a date, you can live on this thing, create an entire social community for yourself just on your iPhone. So many benefits. But yet, if social media were a drug today, 
we would all be so, so addicted. If the iPhone or the Samsung, the Google phone, like if the smartphone were a drug today, we would all be incredibly addicted. In fact, sociologists have been conducting so much experiments surrounding this idea because what they're finding now is that as a result of our addiction to our phones, like our love of staying connected, as a result of our fear of living life disconnected, the fear of missing out, FOMO, what they're actually saying now is that our phones and the way in which we use them are the biggest driving causes of discontentment. I mean, for mankind now, the main reason why some of us feel at times a sense of discontentment is because of our use of our phones. I mean, the reality of it is, is you can now be scrolling whilst having your beans on toast and you can see somebody else who's just fine dining in their kitchen and they're having like steak and the wine glasses are out and like all the expensive cutlery is out and they've just taken a snap like just having tea and you're, deep down you're like, yeah, right, of course you are. You've so set that up for the gram. But there's a part of you that looks at your beans on toast and feels like, well, well my, why, why isn't my life like that? You know, like why aren't I eating like that tonight? And what we end up doing, this is a reason why we end up so discontented, is that we start to compare the behind the scenes aspects of our lives that we all know about against the full in view aspects shown on a highlight reel of social media parts of someone else's life. And really those two things are completely incomparable and yet we do it all the time. It's kind of like, you know, on your first day to the gym, you're feeling really great about yourself and you don't want to dare show a photograph of you pumping the biceps. And yet, as you're scrolling through the gram, you see someone there and it looks like he's inserted baked bean cans into his arms. And you're so infuriated because you're like, how come his arms are so much bigger than mine? How come his whatever is so... This is going incredibly wrong. We're going to stop right there. But the truth is, social media has now become a way in which which you can even measure your popularity. Like when I was a kid, you would know if you weren't popular because you would be the last person to be picked on the football team. Like you would know if you weren't popular because you'd be the guy that had to sit at the front of the bus whilst all the cool kids would throw apples at you. You would know whether or not you were popular by that. But now, popularity will follow you around because you can see exactly how popular you are. You can post a photograph of your cheesy beans or your workout in the gym, and if 30 people like it on Facebook, that's great, and it makes you feel awesome. Until you see your mate's photograph on Instagram, and you see that they've got like 85 likes, and they've got 50 more followers than you, and it doesn't make sense. And why are they so popular? Now we're consistently reminded of our own popularity as a result of the way in which we use our phones. And the truth is, we're addicted. We're hooked. We're fascinated, we wanna know how many people are watching my Instagram reels? How many people are following me? Some people, my kids were telling me about this, fascinating. Apparently, you can even download apps now that will track people who follow you and unsubscribe from following you on social media. I mean, that's like freakish to me. I mean, imagine being inundated with all of that data and information, but this is a thing. And it's causing discontentment. There was a social study that was conducted a few years back where they, in essence, went onto a university campus. And what they did was they split this large group of students and they basically said to them, we want you to just spend 30 minutes on varied different social media platforms. And then immediately after the 30 minutes were up, they asked them to complete a survey. But do you know what was consistent amongst all the participants of this survey? It didn't really matter what social platform you were asked to go on for 30 minutes, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. One third of all of those people that took part in this survey all cited their main emotion that they felt after spending time on their portable device on social media as being envy. Like the number one emotion that they felt was envy. Let's look at what envy is. Envy is an emotion, and it's something that you feel, it's something that you experience. It occurs 
when a person believes that they lack another superior quality, achievement, possession, and either desires it or wishes that the other lacked it. That's what happens and that is the problem with these devices. Now, again, I'm not here to bash the portable device. I am no Luddite, I absolutely love it. But here's the bottom line. While Scripture doesn't talk anywhere about how we should interact on our iPhones, while Scripture doesn't talk or say or mention anything about the way in which we interact with social media, it has so much to say about envy. It has so much to say about discontentment, that feeling of frustration and jealousy when somebody else has something that you don't believe you yet, yet have. The Scriptures talk about that so much. And this is a real issue. In fact, the writer of Proverbs, I think he gets it right in Proverbs 14, where he says that a tranquil heart gives life, but envy makes the bones rot. It's almost like the writer knew something that we're just figuring out today. He was like, the way in which envy can ruin you is it works from the inside out. Like, he doesn't even say that envy can eat away at your flesh. He says that envy, it is that bad, it is that much of a deal that you've got to get a hold of it, that it destroys your bones, the very framework of your entire life. Like, this is a big deal. But don't just take a writer from the Old Testament's word for it. Why don't we have a look very briefly at what James, the brother of Jesus, has to say about envy? Because this was a big deal for him too. He says in James 3.16, For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find evil and disorder of every kind. In other words, James, the brother of Jesus, he knew that contained within the way that we do life sometimes, we on our own have the ability to ruin our own relationships, ruin our own career paths, ruin our own friendships. We can ruin ourselves by the way in which we deal with this emotion of envy, of jealousy, of selfish ambition. And he knew that this should be avoided at all costs. Now again, James wasn't speaking about social media, but he was honest enough to say, hey, listen, there are some things in your life that if you don't get a grip on, like if you look at it and feel like this is so normal because everybody else feels like it's the same for them, that it can't really be a problem for you too. He's like, you're kidding yourself. He was saying, this is so bad. You've got to get a grip of it. Otherwise, envy can ruin every aspect and area of your life. And James, I don't know whether he'd thought about it like this, but this is what we're dealing with today. When you think of the vast areas of discontentment that it can arise in our lives, it's immense. I mean, just think about material and financial discontentment for a moment. That's when you go on Instagram, you're online surfing the web, and you see a picture of his new car. And now all of a sudden, him having the car is not a problem to you at first. I mean, yes, it's the car that you've always wanted. Yes, it's the car that you wish you could have, but you can't afford it. Yes, you're a little bit frustrated that they can do all the things that you can't. But at first, it's no big problem. Until you start to look at it in such a way that makes you feel like what they have, I don't have. And now that's the problem. Because now you don't have what they have. The real issue is, you don't want them to have it either. It's material and financial discontentment. It can happen over a new pair of shoes, a new handbag. Sometimes, you know, like when you see someone's photograph on Instagram, or you see someone's photograph on the World Wide Web, and then what you do is, it might be a picture of them showing off, you know, a new coat, but they're stood in the kitchen. So then what you do is you like scream grab the image and you zoom in, and the coat isn't what intrigues you, but what does is the fact that they've had brand new granite worktops, and you're like, how come they've got the same worktops that I've always wanted? And them having it isn't the issue at first, until you realise that you haven't got what they've got, and now you're aware of that, you don't want them to have it either. It's envy. It causes discontentment. But of course, it's not just in the materialistic aspects of our life that this is an issue too. Because what about relational discontentment? You know, this is when you see, perhaps online, that someone's had a party and it seems as though everybody's been there, but you haven't received the invitation. 
Like someone's had a gathering, a thing, obviously not now in this COVID season, but somebody's doing a gathering and you're not there. And that now equals to you, well, you're no longer a friend and they mustn't like you, they mustn't respect you because if they did all of those things, then they would have invited you. But now you know they've not invited you, so now you know that you're not popular. It starts to create this relational discontentment, like, man, they must hate me. Why aren't they into me? Am I not as good as them? Because they got the invite and I thought we were tight. I thought we were close, but clearly we're not. Has anybody ever felt discontentment like that? Or even this happens sometimes relationally between a husband and a wife. It's kind of like, you know, you go surfing and you see an image of like what, what, what her husband has just built in the garden. Like this incredible water feature that runs into a fish pond that's now got a pool at the bottom of it where you can all sit and dangle your legs in on a hot summer's day. And you're kind of like, well, well, why can't I be like that? And now your wife is like, well, why can't you do that in our garden? And why haven't you done that? And why has, why has he done that? And now all of a sudden it creates this relational discontentment of just sort of feeling like, man, do I not stack up against them? Are they better than me? Am I no good anymore? Like what is really going on? It's easy to become relationally discontented, envious even. But it's not the only way, is it? We could talk about circumstantial discontentment. And this is a thing too. You know, it happens when you look at the stage and the placement of somebody else and where they're at in their life and you start to feel the pain because you just know that you're not there. Maybe you're not there yet or maybe you'll never be there. You just don't know. Like you desperately dream of having a baby and now they're pregnant again. And you're just like, how come it's happening for them and it's not happening for me? Or how come they're able to do a bunch of other stuff but because of a health situation, just the circumstances of what's going on in your world, you feel like, man, why am I always the one that, that the good stuff is left out from ever happening to me? And now what happens, you start to not only be frustrated at what you haven't got, but the real issue is that you start to wish that they didn't have it either. It's envy and it's a huge cause of discontentment. In the Old Testament, there is a guy and his name is Solomon and he is without a shadow of a doubt, the wisest man that has ever lived outside of Jesus. And he thought that this was such a significant issue that he should speak into this because he wanted to basically say, hey, listen, even though I understand that becoming jealous and becoming overly selfishly ambitious and becoming envious at time is so normal for everybody. Even though now, maybe for us today, because of our relationship with our iPhone, our social media content, even though it might be completely normal for everybody else to feel this way, to get angry, to become frustrated, to get internally all tied up and knotted on the inside because of the frustration of where you're not and where they are. Like someone else is further on, someone else is ahead of you. Solomon thought about this issue so much because he was basically saying this, Doing the normal way, that is, that is way overrated. Like if you think that you shouldn't tackle this because this is just the normal way of doing life for you and for everybody else, he was like, no, that's absolutely not a thing. So Solomon, the wisest man, somebody I think who is credible, he's a credible source of just wisdom and information. He basically spells it out to us and he goes, look, don't let this be an issue for you. But then he gives us very practical steps for how we can avoid becoming envious and in turn discontented with life. When in Ecclesiastes 6 verse 9, he says this, enjoy what you have. He's almost making this observational statement where he wants you to focus on the good stuff that you've got. He acknowledges it might not be the best stuff, it might not be what you've always wanted, but enjoy what you have, not what your neighbour has, not what your family member's got, not what your family friend has got, but enjoy what you have. He's saying you've got to learn the art of becoming content with what God has given you. And that might not be, in your opinion, the best thing that's going around the world right now, but if that's what God has given you, if that's what God has entrusted you with, then enjoy what you have. 
He's saying, look, don't spend all of your time staring and gazing at someone else's job. Be thankful and appreciative and enjoy the job that you have. He's saying, look, don't be spending all of your time looking at someone else's husband. Enjoy the husband that you've got. He's saying, listen, don't be fixated on how much money they've got. Enjoy the money that you've got. Be thankful and appreciative of the things that you've got too. You know, sometimes it's a really practical step to take, but it's not a bad thing sometimes to write down some of the stuff that you can truly be thankful for. He says, enjoy what you have. And I think the reason why he's saying this is because if you can't find contentment, if you can't find contentment with what you have now, God will never trust you with what's next. It's contentment through what you already have. But he doesn't stop there, he goes on. Enjoy what you have. And now the next thing he says, rather than desiring what you don't. He's saying, you can't do one without the other. You've got to do both of these simultaneously. You've got to become thankful and find the joy and the blessing with what God has given you. But whatever you do, do not fixate your eyes on someone else's life, someone else's possessions, someone else's stuff, and as a result, miss out on what you've got in your world. He's saying, whatever you do, don't desire what you don't have. But this is incredible. I find this absolutely fascinating because I think that Solomon understood something that's key and significant. I think that Solomon was saying like, whatever you do, don't, don't compare your life to someone else's life. Because I think that he found out to be true for him what many of us found out to be true today for us. The best way to ruin what God's doing in your life, like the best way to destroy whatever it is that's new and a fun thing that's happening in your life that God's doing is by comparing it to what God is doing in someone else's life. It's the best way to ruin your contentment. And Solomon was like, don't do that. Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. And then he makes this statement, just fascinating. He says that just dreaming about nice things, just thinking all of the time, just daydreaming, going off in your own mind, doing your own thing, just dreaming about nice things is meaningless. And it's like chasing the wind, like you're never going to catch it. You're never gonna find happiness doing that. You're never going to find that sense of contentment by looking and staring and becoming obsessed with what everybody else has and you haven't got. It's not the way it works. He was saying there is absolutely no point in doing that because you are going to spend your life like days, weeks, months and years wasting your time because you're never going to catch it doing it that way. Don't just dream about the nice stuff. Don't spend and waste all of your time fixated by someone else's car, someone else's house, someone else's promotion that you want, never got, think that you deserved. He's like, listen, don't waste your time doing that. I can remember one of the most difficult and challenging things that we had to do as a church when we were really young and real small. And what was funny for us is that when we started the church, it wasn't like everything started to work straight away. If I'm dead honest, I had so many moments where I was just like, I, 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 I suck at this. I am not good at it. I think like a cop. I act like a cop. I'm a policeman at heart. And making that transition between being a policeman and a pastor felt like it was just, just the bad choice, a wrong choice. It felt to me so abrasive at times. And often, you know, I'd have pastor friends and they would ring me up like weekly. And you know what? They would say things like, hey, how's the church going? And I'd be like, yeah, it's awesome. And inside I'd be like, man, it, it just, it's not going great. And I didn't have the confidence to say that it wasn't going great. And they'd be like, man, how many hundreds of people are coming? And I'd be like, oh, like 24 people. And they'd be like, okay. And then the next week, someone else would ring me like, how many people's in your church? And I'm like, yeah, we managed to grow the church backwards. We're now down to 18 this week. And it felt like for years that it was just hard. And at the same time, I just did in my life what you would do in a comparable set of circumstances in yours. You jump online and you see how everybody else is killing it. You compare what God has given you to what God is doing in someone else's life. And you now look at your church and you go, well, why aren't we like Fertix Church called Elevation? Like, why are we not there? Hey, why haven't we got 15,000 people in our church like Red Rocks? Hey, why haven't we got? And all of a sudden this stuff happens and I just go, man, I arrived at this place of going, I suck at this. Like, like God, you'd be better off 
finding somebody way better at doing this than me because clearly I, I, I am not good at this. And the more and more people, pastor friends, even in and around Liverpool would reach out to me. You know what I felt God say to me and just challenge me? I felt Him challenge me to stop comparing and to start celebrating. You know, some people ask us about like church growth now and it's nice that you get invitations to do different things and that's all cool and you know, that, that's all nice. It doesn't mean a great deal because the bottom line is for Emma and I is we're just local church boys and girls. Like we've thrown our life into this. We've sacrificed pretty much everything we have to, to see this thing work. But I found that when people really say like, what was it? When was the turning point? If I'm really honest, for me, it was when I made a decision to stop comparing and to start celebrating everybody else and what God's doing in their churches. And I can remember I would sit at my desk and monthly I would write letters and often checks. Because let me tell you, your money always goes where your heart is, right? It's the bottom line. If you wanna know what you really value in life, then look at what you're spending your money on. And I would write letters and I would write checks. Sometimes to people who at times I was incredibly envious of. And I would write to them, and I would go, hey, listen, you probably don't know me. You're never gonna hear of me, but I just want you to know, like I've seen your stuff. I've visited your church or another church minister in Liverpool and there've been loads of them. I'll write them a letter and I'll go, I just wanna say that I'm so thankful for what God is doing in you and through you. I'm incredibly grateful for the years of service that you've given and poured into our city, Liverpool. Hey, listen, we're not where you are, but one day I hope maybe God would use us in that way. But what I found was the more that I would write these letters and the more that often I would bless people financially, you know what I found? I found that I'd learned the art of almost doing what Solomon was saying, which was be joyful and thankful, appreciative with the people and the stuff that God has entrusted to you. And as I did that and stopped comparing against everybody else, you know what I found? I found that, I found that almost it was like God started to trust what we were building. And then tens and twenties and fifties and then hundreds and hundreds of people started to be added to the church. And I look back at that and go, I think that happened because we made a decision to stop comparing and start celebrating the good and the God in other people, which is often not the easiest thing to do. But I think that's the thing that Solomon challenges us to do. When he says, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't, that's just dreaming about nice things and it's meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. He was going, don't do it the way that you think is normal for everybody else. Solomon was saying, look, Normal is overrated the normal way. It will chew up your bones the normal way. It will leave you discontented the normal way. It will leave you feeling so jealous and envious and selfishly ambitious. It's gonna tie you up in knots. And normal is overrated. The best thing that you can really do is enjoy what you have. Enjoy what God's given you. Rather than just staring and looking tirelessly at what God has given to everybody else. And to stop dreaming about what God's doing in someone else's life and instead get a vision for your own life. So as we kick off this series and just start over the next coming weeks, we hope and pray that we will challenge you to be the type of people that can really be observant of the areas in life where maybe normal is overrated. Let me challenge you with this. Can you really imagine the type of church that we could build here in Liverpool? if not one of us amongst us, not one member of staff, team or our church family, if not one of us carried an envious spirit. Could you imagine how incredible that could be for our city? Like if not one of us became jealous or selfishly ambitious of another person, of another thing, of another thing that God's doing in their life. Can you imagine what a statement that that would make to our community? We spoke last week about the way in which we react and interact with one another is the way in which that God really will use to demonstrate that we follow Him. So could you imagine what a difference that would make if we just did what Solomon said? Enjoy what you have. Don't desire what you don't because dreaming about all the nice stuff is meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. He was saying, look, normal, it's just overrated. He was like being fixated and driven by this thing that's not gonna to lead to happiness. You're gonna be discontent. You're gonna be frustrated. You're going to be envious. So let's choose as a church to understand that normal is overrated. Let's stop comparing and let's start celebrating the wins that God's doing in other people's lives and in other people's worlds. Church time has gone. I'd love it if we could just spend a moment and let me just pray for you in closing. 
Heavenly Father, I ask You today that You would you would really, by the power of Your Holy Spirit, help us to do this, because it's not easy. Lord, I pray and ask that we would be implementers of Your Word, that we'd follow Solomon's instruction. Lord God, that we would be thankful and appreciative for what we have, for the people that we have, for the stuff that You've given to us. That we would learn the art of not becoming frustrated as a result of our fixation with what other people have and who other people have. But we'd understand that actually we'd be way better spending our energy on fixing our eyes on You rather than chasing the dreams that are like chasing the wind. So God, we don't wanna do life normal. We don't wanna do life tied up and knotted up from the inside out and have envy and selfish ambition and jealousy eat away at our bones. We don't want that. So Lord, would You help us today to stop comparing and to help us to start celebrating where others are winning. And we ask this all in the mighty Name of Jesus, Amen. Church, wherever you are, let's worship together.
and it's so easy to compare and be envious but like Luke said today we get to choose to fix our eyes on Jesus to celebrate the success of others and find contentment in where you are because hey Jesus God really wants us to live the best and blessed life and if we apply today's message I believe we are one step further to doing that so so good and hey right now you have the opportunity to partner with us financially here at Liverpool One Church all the ways in the screen below you'll get to see different ways you can give but listen we just want to thank you so much for your generosity for your heart to yeah. give willingly week in week out for those of you that give regularly we just want to say a massive thank you we couldn't we wouldn't want to do it without you guys thank you so much it just goes so so far in this yeah. season especially right now we find ourselves and your generosity is making a real difference around the corner around the world and hey we're just so grateful and appreciative of that right now but you have the opportunity to give and we want to swear a massive massive thank you right definitely and hey church this time next week guess what guys and this is your seven day reminder it is valentine's oh. day oh an amazing day wow, a day to celebrate me. yeah i've reminded all you men out there but guys we have some exciting news because we have a competition going out on social media what's this happening week. what's happening we're going to enter because i want to win this are we we have a competition to give away a luxury Valentine's couple's breakfast. It's going to be sent straight to wow. your door on Sunday. Check so that. guys, you don't want to miss this. So get yourself on social media, enter the competition, and you might be winning the luxury breakfast. Well, Are we going to win? That If we win, like that just takes a massive checkbox off my list for sure. But hey guys, what a fantastic service. Thanks for tuning in online. Hey, have a great week. Stay safe and we'll get catch up with you guys real soon. Thank you.